I also want to thank my colleague, my counterpart, the special envoy for the People's Republic of China, Xia Zhenhua. She and I, Xia Zhenhua and I have known each other now for 30 years or plus. We used to crisscross the planet and meet in an airport here and there and catch a moment and go on to our responsibilities. But I think that uh, what we were able to do at Sunnylands really was a product of uh, a lot of years of building some trust, building um, a genuine friendship. And we, I know that's hard for people to understand in this world we live in where everything's polarized and balkanized. But in fact, uh, I think it had a great deal to do with our ability to be able to work on Paris, work on Glasgow, and now together be able to uh, work here in Dubai. Uh, this meeting is actually an outgrowth of the meeting that we had at Sunnylands. We spent four days uh, negotiating and talking and thinking um, and having a little fun here and there. Uh, but uh, this was an agreement that we made to have a summit here to talk about the issue of methane. When we did Paris, I had the pleasure of, and, and the privilege of leading our negotiating team in Paris. Methane wasn't even talked about. Just think of that. Five years ago, people didn't talk about methane in the context of the climate crisis. And in Glasgow, President Biden stood up and said, we're going to have a methane challenge. That by 2030, 30% 30 a reduction across the board, not for one nation, but globally. And if we achieve that 30% reduction, which we think we can, it is the equivalent of every airplane, every car, every truck, every ship in the world going to zero in that period of time. That is monumental, folks. And so we're very appreciative of all those who have embraced this notion. We know, and it's almost cliched now, and I'm going to try to resist it. I don't want to get into the crisis of the moment or the level of the crisis or where we are. But let me just tell you bluntly, when the best scientists in the world unanimously are telling us as leaders in our countries that we are on the brink of tipping points, from which you cannot come back, irreversible, that the permafrost or the Barents Sea ice or the, or the coral reefs or, most importantly, the Arctic and the Antarctic may be at tipping point or beyond. Last summer, it was 70 degrees Fahrenheit above normal in the Arctic. It was 100 degrees Fahrenheit above normal in the Antarctic. And a massive component of ice that had been lodged in the mud because it was so heavy, it was stuck there, has now melted sufficiently that it's risen and moving across the southern ocean towards Georgia Island, and it will melt and accelerate the sea level rise of the planet. So this year, we just learned yesterday, it was confirmed, it's not when we learned it, was the hottest year in history, human history, that we measured. But that's true now of every year, almost. For the last 30 years, decades, three, year, three decades ago was the third now warmest. The second decade was the second warmest, and this last decade, the warmest in history. So I'm not going to say more about it, except to say that if we can't hear Mother Nature and can't judge with our own eyes what the science is telling us, this is not about politics, there's no ideology, there's no pejorative against any one business or any approach. There is simply mathematics and physics and some chemistry and biology. That is what we are acting on. So we fortunately were able to come to agreement with China and the United States that we are, as the two largest emitters in the world, obviously we understand it's important for us to be able to find cooperation here. No one country, no business anywhere in the world will solve this problem by itself. It will take the essence of multilateralism and, and global cooperation to be able to make this happen. Reducing methane emissions by at least 30 percent in 2030 is totally in line with the global methane pledge 
which could avoid over 0.2 degrees centigrade of warming by 2050. Every expert agrees that dealing with methane, which in its early years of release into the atmosphere, is 80 to 100 times more destructive than CO2. Or dealing with it in the later years, when it is still 20 times more destructive than CO2, is critical to our ability to hold on to 1.5 degrees. The fact is that tackling methane, fugitive gas, which now rises from the thawing of permafrost in the tundra, in Alaska, in Russia, it is fugitive gas. And it just is out there doing damage unless we discover how we're going to stop it or keep it from leaking or flaring or venting. So, my friends, this is the fastest, simplest, easiest, quickest, cheapest way to be able to make the gains we need to make to reduce the threat to the planet. Now, action to reduce HFCs is also in line with the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol and increasing cooling efficiency in this decade could reduce 0.1% of degrees of warming by 2050. Non-CO2 greenhouse gases also cause almost 500,000 deaths every year from respiratory illnesses and 6% of global crop loss, food production loss, at a time when global production is already deeply strained. Rapidly reducing non-CO2 emissions is a three-in-one winner. It is advancing global climate crisis challenge, uh, responses. It is providing cleaner air. And food security objectives are met simultaneously. So the stakes, obviously, are what I described. The scientists are saying this moment is alarming. It's without precedent. It is terrifying, some have said. And others will say, we are in uncharted territory. So that is why it is critical that we include all greenhouse gases in the next round of the nationally determined contributions, or NDCs, that will be finalized by 2025. And I'm really heartened, we're all encouraged, that China, President Xi and Xi Jinping's work, and his team committed to do this in sunny lands, and I call on the global community to likewise commit to include all greenhouse gases economy-wide in future NDCs. This is a fundamental starting point that we need to agree on. In addition to future NDCs, we need to take action now. And I'm pleased to announce a few ways in which the United States is working with our partners to advance methane mitigation at home and abroad. Earlier today, the United States finalized standards to sharply reduce methane emissions from oil and gas operations. And those efforts will achieve a nearly 80 percent reduction and is planning a rulemaking review. We, the United States, are planning a rulemaking review on methane emission standards for landfills. The United States and the European Union launched a global methane pledge two years ago in Glasgow, with 100 countries joining. At COP27 in Charm, we were able to grow the list of endorsements to 150 countries. And I'm pleased today to announce new Global Methane Pledge endorsements from Angola, Kenya, and Romania. And I'm particularly excited that Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan joined yesterday, and Kosovo, President Kosovo is here, joined today. And I look forward to hearing from Kazakhstan in a few minutes. We are working to turn the pledge itself into action. Over 86 countries, covering well over half of emissions, have national methane action plans in place or engaging with our partners to develop them. And we are launching exciting new initiatives and partnerships, including lowering organic waste, or low methane, to support subnational waste reduction efforts around the globe. 
And to help support these country efforts, my friends, President Biden launched the, the methane finance sprint at the April 2023 Major Economies Forum, which he hosted at the White House. That had the aim of raising $200 million in order to help us go forward. Well, I'm very pleased to announce today that the United States, the European Union, other governments, philanthropies, and the private sector significantly exceeded that target. And together, we have mobilized over $1 billion in new grant funding since COP27 for methane in the field. That is more than triple previous annual methane grant funding, and it will leverage billions more in project investment. And these funds are going to support cutting methane emissions across all sectors with a focus on low- and middle-income countries. As part of this effort, my friends, well, let me just add one other thing to this. In addition, for the first time, I will, I'll be very quick, but I don't want to miss some of these things because they are new and groundbreaking, breaking specifically. We have a group of oil and gas companies that have stepped up and have decided to take a leadership role in helping to deal with this challenge on a local basis. So Equinor, Total, BP, Eni, Oxy, and Shell have each decided that they are going to put up $25 million each in order to put that into the field and help people learn how to be able to reduce those emissions and move forward. And we're working with one other company that is here that we hope uh, would be able to understand a novel approach and implement that. So we will continue to add to this effort as we go forward. Final thing, I, I want to just quickly get off of here, obviously. But I want to thank our host of the COP28 presidency team. We thank them for their contribution to the methane finance sprint. We thank them for their partnership in this event throughout the COP. And I again thank Shia Jemwa because uh, he has really labored in the fields of this, uh, this challenge for a long period of time and uh, critical to our ability to move forward. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you so much, John Kerry, Special Envoy. And forgive me for interrupting you, but I have been reminded that all four of you have a very pressing diplomatic commitment, and therefore time is of the essence. So uh, excuse me for that brief uh, timekeeping hint. And uh, now to China's Envoy, Xi Zhenhua, and also to you the request, if you would, to keep your remarks uh, fairly concise. Thank you. Ah 一次考察了北极已经从过去我们认为的未来的挑战已经变成了现实的危机欢迎各位参加这次峰会
。面对当前全球气候变化的严峻形势，我们共聚一堂，探讨控制甲烷和其他非二氧化碳温室气体排放的具体措施。刚才我见了一些石油公司的那个领导人，他们讲了，他们在采取行动。也愿意和中国开展合作，共同来减少温这个甲烷和温室气体的排放，这非常好。所以呢，我们要要要在这方面啊，要有具体的措施，要有资金的支持，要有技术的路径，这样对我们携手共同应对全球气候变化的挑战，具有重要的意义和深远的影响。中国自2007年制定《中国应对气候变化国家方案》起，在五年规划纲要和碳达峰、碳中和相关政策文件当中，均提出了加强甲烷等非二氧化碳温室气体管控的相关要求。近年来，中国在甲烷等非二氧化碳排控排上取得了一定的成效，在能源领域推动减少能源生产甲烷排放，鼓励甲烷回收利用；在农业领域大力推进畜禽养殖、废物资源化利用及化肥零增长行动；在废物处理领域实施了生活垃圾分类制度。推广污水收集处理、污泥厌氧消化等技术，同时推动利用市场机制，激励企业减少甲烷的排放。通过国家重点研发计划，支持甲烷排放的控制和回收利用研究以及技术开发，在含氟气体管控方面。中国接受了基加利修正案，实施了氢氟碳化物进出口许可证制度，发布了《中国消耗臭氧层物质替代品的推荐名录》，推广绿色低碳的替代品。下一步，我们将全面的实施氢氟碳化物国内配额许可制度。各位同事，各位朋友。中国还是一个正在发展中的国家，在控制甲烷等非二氧化碳温室气体排放上，仍然面临着一系列艰巨的困难和风险的挑战。中国甲烷排放控制工作起步晚，基础弱，数据基础不清，统计核算和监测监管能力不足，法规标准政策体系。应不完善，技术和管理能力亟待提高。中国开展甲烷等非二氧化碳气体的控排，不是轻而易举、一朝一夕就能够实现的，需要经过艰苦的长期努力，开展大量基础工作和能力建设。我想这一点呢，广大的发展中国家，这个和我们现在的处境是一样的。我们愿意干，但是呢，我们能力差，还需要继续努力，通过国际合作来加强这方面的工作。尽管如此，中方仍然克服重重困难，制推动制定，并于今年十一月，中国政府发布了《甲烷排放控制行动方案》，这是中国开展甲烷排放管理和控制的首个。顶层设计文件对中国的甲烷控排工作进行了系统的梳理和部署，编制并发布了甲烷方案，是推动高质量发展、推动减污降碳协同增效的内在要求，是积极应对气候变化的自主行动，也是对应对全球气候变化的积极贡献。应对气候变化重在落实，我们将把甲烷方案的制度设计和任务要求转化为实际行动，不断的夯实基础能力，在能源、农业和废物处理领域
采取具体的、有效的措施，处理好甲烷管控和能源安全、粮食安全、产业链供应链安全和保障人民生活等方面的关系。我们非常愿意与各方开展合作，不断的提高能力，积极推动落实。重点领域甲烷管控计划任务与措施，推动降污、降碳、减污、扩绿增长，为积极应对全球气候变化做出中国的贡献。我非常感谢这个阿联酋索尔坦主席，这个给我们提供了这么好的一个平台。我也非常感谢跟我合作了三十年的克里先生。我们建立的友谊和我们共同努力的这个事业，能够取得积极的进展。谢谢大家，谢谢大家。Thank you very much to China Climate Envoy Xi Jinhua for those remarks. And ladies and gentlemen, as we have heard from our hosts, a number of countries are signing up now to methane. Emission reduction commitments, and for that reason, as emblematic of that effort, we do welcome Nigerian President Tinubu as Africa's largest oil and gas producer. Nigeria has set itself the goal of reducing methane em emissions from flaring by 100 percent by 2030, and integrating that goal into development planning and its NDC. So, welcome to you, sir. You have the floor. Thank you very much,、uh, President of the COP28. Thank you for providing this platform and、uh, managing it effectively well. John Kerry, Your Excellencies, and other distinguished ladies and gentlemen, today we welcome the. Effectiveness of your leadership that has given us the hope to sustain livelihood in the rest of the world. The earth has been injured, not by us mainly. By the big economies, and I'm glad two of them are here. John Kerry and the China making pledges is very good, and we are with you, even though. We are the least beneficiary of what has happened. Sitting there hearing you, I know I have to commit ourselves, and we have been doing so before today. We are committed. To critical steps to reduce methane emission by ensuring flood gas,、uh, flood gas are eliminated. There's a huge penalty for that. There's equally a huge incentive for to do so. The measures that we are taking here is a welcome development. No doubt about that, and we are with the leadership of UAE for the commitment so so far. We are consolidating on the gas export usage domestically and export. For other countries, I can assure you that we will be partner in progress to achieve 
renewable. We are committed to energy mix. We are providing cooking gas for a large population. We will continue to do that. We've signed off on reduction of methane. We will leverage a new technology. And we hope the two giant nations and the Emirates will be able to help us through. The Africa, that what I know of Africa, is the fact that the risk in additional investment and technological know-how, it is very necessary. And the largest economies that have benefited immensely to do more really fast because they have need healing and is crying for attention more quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Tanubu. And before I invite the three of four of you to take your places uh, once more, let me ask if we can get a very quick photo of the four of you to commemorate this moment.